Google just rolled out personal intelligence in Gemini, meaning your assistant can now pull context from your Gmail, photos, and connected apps. OpenAI is pushing global mass adoption with ChatGPT Go at eight a month while preparing to test ads inside Free and Go accounts. Meanwhile, Black Forest Labs just launched Flux.2 Klein, bringing sub 0.5 second photorealistic image generation to regular consumer GPUs. And on top of all that, Google is officially making a third attempt at smart glasses in 2026, aiming to finally beat the Google Glass curse. So let's talk about it. All right, so let's start with the biggest one, Google rolling out something called personal intelligence in Gemini. Google basically announced that Gemini is getting this new capability that uses your own data from Gmail, Google Photos, and other connected apps to give you personalized suggestions. And that sounds obvious, right? Like, yeah, no kidding, that's what an assistant should do. But here's the thing, assistants historically were never truly personal. They were basically generic chatbots that you could talk to. They had no long-term context and no real memory of your life unless you manually told them everything. Even Google Assistant, Siri, Alexa, they were more like voice-controlled search boxes than real assistants. What Google's doing here is different. They're turning Gemini into something that can actually look at your past interactions, your emails, your photos, your activity, and then generate recommendations based on that. So instead of Gemini giving you some random travel itinerary for Paris that looks like it came from a tourism brochure, it can create something that's tailored to you. Like it remembers what kind of places you usually like, it can pull details from your previous trips, it can even identify patterns from photos you've taken. And Google is positioning this feature as something for families, individuals, professionals, basically anyone already living inside Google's ecosystem for organization, travel planning, daily schedules, all that. Now, the most interesting part is how Google is selling this. They're emphasizing privacy and user control like crazy. They're saying unlike earlier assistant approaches, Gemini is built so that you can control what apps are connected, and even more importantly, you can control when personalization is active. That detail is massive. So you're not just handing Google the keys permanently. You can basically turn the personalization on and off in real time and choose exactly which connected apps are feeding Gemini the context. And Google claims Gemini references the data in real time without using it for model training. That's the line they want everyone to remember. We're not training on your private Gmail and photos. They do mention that filtered prompts and responses can be used. So it's not a perfect zero data usage promise. But still, they're drawing a hard boundary between personalization and training. And they also stress transparency. Gemini is supposed to be more open about where information came from, so the answers don't feel like creepy mind reading. And then there's the whole opt-out thing. Google says you can always opt out, adjust privacy settings, and that the system has guardrails, especially around sensitive topics. And they even talk about review and correction features. So if Gemini gets something wrong, users can correct it. Now, that's all great marketing, but why is Google doing this right now? Because personalization is the ultimate lock-in strategy. If Gemini becomes the place where all your digital life connects Gmail, photos, maps, planning, then it becomes extremely hard to switch away. You can't just go, oh, I'll use another assistant because no other assistant has your personal context inside Google's universe like that. And Google knows that's their advantage. They have the data. They already own the platforms people use daily. So Gemini with personal intelligence is basically Google saying, we're gonna win assistance through context. And honestly, if they pull it off smoothly without privacy scandals, it's a scary advantage. Now, while Google is going in that direction, AI that knows you, OpenAI is pushing in a totally different direction. OpenAI just launched ChatGPT Go globally. This is their new cheap subscription tier that's rolling out worldwide to every country where ChatGPT is available. And it started in India in August 2025, but now it's expanding everywhere. And in the US, it's priced at eight a month. So it sits between free and the standard 20 a month plus plan. And this is actually a pretty aggressive move because for most people, 20 a month is still a bit of a mental barrier. It's like Netflix pricing. Some people pay it, but a lot of people hesitate. Eight is different. Eight feels like a casual subscription, like whatever, I'll try it. And what makes Go important is that OpenAI didn't make it useless. Go is built around GPT 5.2 Instant for heavy day-to-day -day use. It gives more messages than the free tier, it gives file uploads, and it gives image generation. So it's not just a slightly better free plan, it's meant to be your daily workhorse. On top of that, Go also includes longer memory and a larger context window, which again, is the real thing that matters for daily use. Because once you have memory and a bigger context, it stops being a toy. 
It also expands access to advanced data analysis with Python, supports projects, and it allows subscribers to create and edit custom GPTs. That right there is the ecosystem play. If even the eight tier can create and edit custom GPTs, that means OpenAI wants millions and millions of people building tiny assistants and tools and workflows. That grows the platform. That makes ChatGPT feel like an operating system, not just a chatbot. Now the trade-offs are obvious. Go users don't get GPT 5.2 Pro. They don't get legacy models like GPT 4.0. Tools like the Codex Agent and Expanded Deep Research stay exclusive to plus and higher tiers. So it's still a ladder system. OpenAI isn't giving away everything. But still, Go is a huge push into the mass market. And now comes the part that's gonna annoy a lot of people. OpenAI announced ads will be tested in the US for free and Go in the coming weeks. Ads inside ChatGPT. And they're saying it's to support the lower price point. Plus, pro, business, and enterprise plans will remain ad-free. So they're basically setting up an ad-supported AI economy. And OpenAI is trying to make it sound safe. They say ads will be labeled and separated from answers. They say ads won't influence responses. They say ads will be blocked around sensitive topics like health and politics. So you won't be asking, I have chest pain, and then see buy this supplement. And that's important, because if ads ever get mixed into answers, that completely destroys trust instantly. But still, this is a major turning point. It's OpenAI admitting that to scale massively, AI needs either higher prices or advertising. This is basically the YouTube model. Either you pay more or you watch ads. And apparently, some Go users already reported subscription and upgrade edge cases in OpenAI forums. Which makes sense because every time you add a new tier, billing gets messy. So you've got Google building personal intelligence by connecting your personal life and OpenAI building mass adoption by making ChatGPT cheaper and ad supported. Now before we go into the glasses stuff, let's talk about the third story because it's one of the most technically crazy ones. Black Forest Labs just launched Flux.2 Klein. And if you've been paying attention to image generation, you already know Flux as one of the highest quality systems in terms of photorealism. Now they dropped a new model family aimed at developers, creators, and research teams, basically anyone who needs fast, high quality image generation and editing and doesn't want to wait forever. The launch includes two model variants, a 4B and a 9B, and the licensing is split in a very deliberate way. The Flux.2 Klein 4B model is Apache 2.0, that's a very open license. It's basically go build whatever you want. The 9B model is under the Flux non-commercial license. So you can test it, use it, play with it, but you can't just build your paid SaaS around it and monetize it directly. Both models are public and available right now. Demos open to all. Now here's the main reason this is massive. Flux.2 Klein is built for sub-second inference speeds. They're talking about generating or editing images in under 0.5 seconds. That's not pretty fast. That's real time. That means image generation stops being a separate step and becomes something that can happen inside workflows instantly. And the other key detail is hardware. They claim it fits on consumer GPUs with as little as 13 gigabytes VRAM. That is huge because most creators don't have 48 gigabyte workstation GPUs. They have consumer cards. So if you can run an image generator that's photorealistic and fast on consumer hardware, you basically unlock a giant wave of local first creative tooling. Now, they also highlight this unified architecture. That means the same architecture supports text to image, image editing, and multi-reference generation. So it's not three separate models duct taped together. It's one system that can do everything. Then they go deeper into optimization, quantized FP8 and NVFP4 versions. Quantization here is important because it reduces VRAM usage by up to 55%. So suddenly, this model family becomes accessible to even more GPUs. And the claim is that unlike older releases, the Klein models deliver photorealistic outputs with high diversity and production-ready APIs. That last part matters because a lot of models look great in demos but are annoying to integrate. They're saying this is ready for real production use. Benchmarks indicate the 9B matches or surpasses much larger competitors in both speed and visual quality. So Black Forest is essentially saying, we can compete with way bigger systems while running faster and lighter. And they frame it as powering real-time, agent-ready visual intelligence. That phrase, agent-ready, is key. Because once images can be generated and edited instantly, agents can start using visuals as part of tasks, not as a gimmick, as a normal tool. 
like an agent building slides, generating diagrams, editing images, making product mockups, rapidly prototyping ideas. So yeah, Flux.2 Klein is one of those releases that might not go viral on mainstream Twitter, but developers will absolutely build crazy things on top of it. Now to finish this off, we need to talk about the most human story here, smart glasses. Because we're now more than a decade away from Google Glass. Google Glass was announced in 2013. It was pulled back quickly, partly because adoption was low. People felt uncomfortable around it. The original version released in 2014, then the second iteration in 2017 was aimed at workplaces. That one was withdrawn in 2023. So basically, Google tried twice and failed. But in December 2025, Google promised two new smart glasses products for 2026. And the article asks the obvious question, why did Google smart glasses struggle where others are now succeeding? The answer comes down to wearability and social acceptability. The most successful wearables are built into accessories people already like wearing. Watches, rings, bracelets, glasses. Stuff society already normalized over centuries. And newer academic research is literally moving in that direction, building sensors into jewelry people want to wear. Researchers even developed the Wear Scale Wearable Acceptability Range to measure social acceptability. That scale includes questions like whether your peers would find it acceptable to wear. And Noreen Kelly from Iowa State University and colleagues found that at its core, the scale measures two things. First, whether the device helps you reach a goal so it's actually worth wearing. Second, whether it creates social anxiety about privacy or looking rude. That's basically Google Glass in one sentence. People felt glass was invasive. They felt watched, even if you weren't recording. And that's where the term glass holes came from. So even though smart glasses have benefits, mental health applications, surgical support, the privacy concern is still there. But what the article says is really interesting. Look and feel is still the most common buyer concern. People want devices that are desirable accessories first smart technology second. And the products that actually succeeded were usually designed with fashion and brand identity in mind. That's why Snapchat spectacles were more accepted socially, cameras, but presented in a more normal way. And the biggest success in this category today comes from Meta, collaborating with designer brands like Ray-Ban and Oakley. Most of these products include front-facing cameras and conversational voice agents from Meta AI. So the market basically moved toward glasses that look normal but have AI. Now Google's plan for 2026 includes two products. One is audio only. The other includes screens shown on the lenses, like Google Glass projections. And Google is basically implying they'll change the form factor drastically. Instead of the futuristic, scary design of old glass, it'll look like normal glasses. Google literally describes the goal as building glasses you'll want to wear. They're also working with popular brand partners. And beyond aesthetics, Google has a massive advantage in integration. Because Google has search, maps, Gmail, Meta doesn't. The promo materials show Google Maps info inside the glasses while walking. That is the killer use case. Navigation directly in your field of view. And then there's sensors. The article suggests a major opportunity is adding additional sensors and integrating with Google's health ventures, including smart rings. A lot can be sensed from the head, heart rate, body temperature, galvanic skin response, even brain activation via EEG. And with consumer neurotechnology advancing, it's plausible we see smart glasses capturing EEG brain data in the next few years. And if that happens, that's where the whole AI assistant story becomes something else entirely. Because now AI isn't just reading your email, it's tracking your body state, stress, attention in real time. All right, that's it. If you enjoyed this one, drop a like and subscribe. Thanks for watching, and I'll catch you in the next one.